All right, hello, friends. Chris McMillan here with Autonomy Season 1. I'm here with Simon Crims. Simon is the author of Roller Dog, hmm. a very interesting and intriguing children's book. Um, Simon, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me today. Um, no, yeah. yeah, no problem. You're, so you're from Australia and you live in Japan, is that right? Yep, yeah. How, so long, been, have you been, how long have you been here? Now. So I'm, I'm, I've kind of become a bit Japanese. Excellent. Um, <laughs> what part of Japan are you living in? Or which area? Osaka. Okay. Osaka. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to pretend to, you know, I'm not going to give you that glazed over look. I'm going to say, well, I'm not sure where that is <laughs> instead of smile and pretend that I know where. It's where 500 it is. kilometers west of Tokyo. So it's, it's um, uh, well, it's the second largest city after Tokyo. Well, I certainly should know that. Um, I'm always learning geography, always learning. Um, what about Roller Dog? It's an excellent book. My kids love it. Um, we've had it for several years. The story is fun. Um, the imagery is, it never ends. The, in, the imagery never ends. Um, what motivated you to write it? Um, what's the backstory with that? Um, okay, so in 2005, I... I, I I came to Japan in 2004 and in 2005 I watched Loose Change second edition. Um, you know, this is going back old school 9-11 truth stuff. Um, it was one of the, one of the first 9-11 truth films to come out. And in that film, I saw building seven claps and that, that was really intriguing. And I just sent me on a kind of a spiral of research into 9-11. And I became incredibly angry and quite quickly realized, yeah, actually prior to that, I'd had some suspicions about it, but nothing uh, along the lines of, you know, uh, uh, what, what we know now about um, <laughs> that, that event. And um, I started writing a book about 9-11, um, which I might do in the future, but I, I kind of feel like 9-11 has been done to death. Um, and... Then in 2007 or 2008, the financial crisis, the financial crisis occurred, yeah. and I realized that the book about 9-11, well, at the same time, I've been researching and starting to realize that there was, the, the rabbit hole, hole went way deeper than 9-11, of course, right? And so I started um, working on uh, an, uh, the, the Roller Dog book as a way to kind of cover a lot more territory than the previous book I've been working on solely about 9-11. And... The reason why I started doing kids books is, is just that that was my skill set. Uh, I, I can draw and um, uh, it's also, you know, the, the people we're trying to work against have been focusing on children for a very long time and mainly in the truth movement, uh, you know, there's a lot of focus on pulling adults out of the matrix and not so much on kind of developing a, um, well, an alternative or a, a uh, dissident um, kind of, well, a dissident uh, approach to children's education, right? Yeah. That's, that's the reason behind that. Yeah. Um, the, the School Such Project with Brett Vanant, are you familiar with his work? Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't, I mean, I used to, I mean, to be honest, in the last, since I published the Roller Dog book, my direction has taken, or the, the, my focus of research and reading has taken me in a different direction. But I used to listen to a lot of um, kind of ANCAP stuff and, um, you know, um, his work probably about eight years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, uh, so, yeah, I am familiar. Yeah. Um, he's, def he's got pretty much the same idea. You know, yeah. um, it revolves around uh, because the whole indoctr public indoctrination system, that's where they get them. They get them young. So yeah. um, by, you know, keeping your kids out of school, that's a solution. And if you can't do that, then um, just make sure they know the alternate, um, the alternate truth, um, embedding by teaching critical thinking these kind of skills um, because not everybody can pull their kids out of school depending where they are as well. Uh, yep. It is a very serious topic. Um, it's, it's probably, you know, 
uh, sooner or later, it's going to be illegal to, to homeschool, probably in some states, I'd say. Like, uh, or at least they'll, they'll try to do that anyway. Yeah. 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 Um, we know that would be ideal for the powers that shouldn't be. But <laughs> it's, the, whole, the homeschooling situation in the U.S. is looking pretty strong. And um, we also experienced a little bit of it in Spain, uh, mm. which was a strange situation. It's a very gray area there. It's not legal, nor is it illegal. And right. there was a massive, there is a massive uh, gathering of homeschoolers there as well. So people are waking up from what I see. Um, for Everybody has their own reasons for pulling their kids out of school. Mm. But yeah, the indoctrination system is where it begins. Um, Did- can I ask where you're located? I'm near, I'm an hour east of Dallas at the moment. Okay, right. right. Yeah. <laughs> and did your kids go to school for any time or they just, you, you always homeschooled them? Yeah, yeah. They've, they've never stepped foot in a school. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, maybe if they want to go to university when they're older, that's up to them. But by then they will know the game that they're involved with. Yeah. Yeah. That's the plan. <laughs> Uh, your website um, at crims.com I just wanted to read this introduction here Um, Roller Dog is a book designed for little people growing up in a brave new world order I love that of the 21st century rather than instilling fear in young minds the storyline about Humphrey the Roller Dog creates an image of hope however the pictures are crafted for deeper interpretation by adult readers compose a message of warning. I, I thought that was brilliant. You know, that pretty much sets the stage for what Roller Dog is about. Um, how long did it take you to write altogether? That writing, oh yeah, the, 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 well, the text is very short, as you know. So I think I, that took about uh, a month or something, you know? And actually it was kind of interesting uh, the, the way uh, I was writing it, in, you know, I, I I'd be half asleep and I'd have some rhyming couplet and I'd just scribble it down yeah. and I kind of put it together over about a month. And then the, the actual illustration took six years. But I mean, that, I wasn't serious until the last sort of, well, for the first three years, I really wasn't serious. It was just a kind of pet project. And then, um, you know, it's kind of a catharsis. I think a lot of this, this stuff, you know, it's probably a catharsis for you to do this as well. Because you, you just get such anger from the, the matrix of lies, you know, it, it, um, it, it, it just helps to kind of push back against it. So, um, yeah, I, six years of, of kind of working after, you know, I was working full time, of course, as an English teacher and then working after school and then on weekends. Um, but, you know, I'm not um, or back then I was far less. Um, uh, well, uh, how would I say, um, self-controlled, self-realized, uh, self-actualized than I am now. And yeah. so I was really you know, not, um, not working effectively um, at that time. Hmm. Uh, the, the drawings, the details are just incredible. If it's okay with you, uh, <laughs> you just go through a little bit here. Um, like the first page, I'm not going to go through every page. Don't worry. <laughs> but the first page is your, there's a strong introduction of hard hitting books. I've got Anatomy of the State by Rothbard, mm-hmm. On the Road by Jack Kerouac, Tragedy and Hope by Carol Quigley, which mm-hmm. I've got right here behind me. Yep, I see that. Shrugged by Ayn Rand, um, Brave New World, of course. And I didn't know this one. I, mu- I probably did, but I didn't realize um uh yeah the the collectivism one and i hadn't noticed it at first because it's kind of dark but the, the theory, theory of uh, oligarchical collectivism yeah, yeah, by, yeah. Uh, it's, daniel goldstein right <laughs> it's a fictional book it is the, the what they called the book in 1984 by george orwell yeah. yeah yeah fascinating um is there any particular reason you chose those particular books um um well, on the road is obvious, right? Because it, it, it's sort of a prelude to the, the journey that Humphrey takes. Um, uh, I think I just, at that time, I'd sort of finished reading uh, Ayn Rand's work. And so, you know, and it's also, I tried to select something that, you know, 
like what, what I was trying to do is, is give people sort of inroads into, so I chose Anatomy of the State because it's a very short book yeah. which people who are politically minded could probably get into and get a quick understanding of what I know. What people have, uh, what what problems people have when they complain about the state, you know, yeah. uh, and the sort of introduction to anarcho-capitalism. And then Ayn Rand's work is better for people who are more fictionally minded. I mean, not fictionally minded, but uh, a, a um, yeah. you know what I mean. A, yeah, more objectively you know, minded. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, tragedy and hope. I mean, I have that upstairs as well. And I, I mean, I have not read the whole thing, but I've read parts of it. But, um, yeah. Same here. It's a really heavy book to try and read, right? Yeah. And um, so there's that. And um, what was the other one? Um, uh, Brave New World, which... Brave New World, yeah, again, like, a, yeah. Sort yeah, of. I mean, 1984 and Brave New World are almost cliche in, you know, it's, you know, it, it, I did not realize that that book, that was a fictional book, 1984. I think they're perfect, you know, for an introduction because that sets the stage for someone... You know, because it's not discreet, um, but Tragedy and Hope, you know, the lessons behind Tragedy and Hope with Carol, Car you know, that Carol Quigley wrote with Cecil Rhodes and the Round Table, it's everything that's happening today is an accumulation of, you know, what's explained in these books. So I thought that was just brilliant um, what you did there. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think Huxley was absolutely correct. He, he, I don't know if you know this quote where he said, like, um, well, my, my vision of uh, my vision of the future is far more likely than uh, all wells or something, something like that. I know, I forget what he said. He said like, um, uh, I, well, didn't, I, I forget he, didn't he write a letter to Orwell, uh, basically saying, or no, vice versa? Didn't Orwell write a letter to Huxley saying, "Yeah, your version is probably right." I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but I mean, there was definitely I, I a letter. Really but I, I remember the direct quote like from a Huxley interview where he said, um, you can do anything with, well, he was quoting somebody else actually, you can do anything with bayonets, but sit on them. And that's very true, you know? So, I mean, force will take you so far, but I mean, uh, it, it cannot be sustained. And so, um, in, it, in, in a way, we've got a kind of combination of, of uh, 1984 and, um, Brave New World in, you know, got the surveillance state of 1984 and we've got, uh, you know, we've got all our little personal surveillance devices here, right? Exactly. Yep. <laughs> little snake and, um, in the pocket. Yeah. 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 But um, yeah, all the, all the, um, the, the other stuff regarding sort of the appeal to baser elements of human nature, which are, um, uh, you know, demonstrated in, in Brave New World course that we, we can see that all around us now the sexualization of society and everything like this yeah mm. very good um i have to ask you is that a reference on the second page humphreys by the door is that a reference to stairway to heaven it is yeah <laughs> very well, good it's not stairway, stairway, stairway to heaven that 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 image which is in there which is called the hermit um the, the actual picture yeah you've got it inside the what it's on the on the um Led Zeppelin for album cover is the picture of the hermit and he is the light bearer. Um, it's, it's somebody who has spent a, like, look at all the books behind you, <laughs> Chris. I mean, obviously you spend a lot of time by yourself reading. And I mean, that, that is as much as know, I can. Yeah. That, that's, that's where illumination occurs. Um, of course we have to have conversations with each other, but I mean, you have to spend a lot of time reading by yourself and, and yeah, that's, yeah. that's what the reference is too. That's great. Um, do you happen to remember, there's a symbol on the door um, and it's, I, I suppose it's Japanese. Do you happen to remember what that means? Yeah, that's uh, Shinjitsu, which is truth. Shoot, truth in Japanese. I like it. Yeah, truth. Yeah, I, so it's I, sort of going through the door of truth. So it's like a symbol of, of Humphrey leaving. Uh, well, you can, you, you can see on the, on the, on the left side, there's a picture of Humphrey with his family and yeah. kind of autobiographical because that's my, my family all as dogs <laughs> and I am the roller dog, right? So like, uh, yeah, leaving, um, the, the, uh, leaving the matrix, going through the door of truth as it were, you know? 
That's brilliant. I did not catch that. Yeah, there you go. Opening the door to truth. I love it. Um, yeah, and yeah, uh, again, uh, just all the references, like um, he's going through on the road. There's uh, there's a reference to nanothermites, which was found in the dust in what was left over of 9-11, you know, the proof of explosives. Mm-hmm. Um, the toad, um, for me, represents statism. Um, am I... Am I interpreting that correctly? I actually, I based it on Dick Cheney, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, don't like I don't base the, 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 the hair and everything on Dick Cheney. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, uh, well, the state will always utilize high IQ. Do, are you familiar with cluster B disorder? Person? No. Okay, so cluster B is is uh, what refers to um, psychopathy, narcissism, and borderline personality disorder. So there's a lot of um, you know high IQ psychopaths who are always used by power, established power, to do their bidding. You know, they they, they, they these so uh, the cluster B disorder is a kind of well, it's a low functioning or you could say malfunctioning amygdala, which is the part of the brain which is responsible for receiving uh, or processing visual stimuli and working out if it's dangerous or not. Fear response, uh, empathy, many other things, right? So there's people who have low functioning amygdalas. They don't, they're unable to have empathy for others, but their actual brain structure is, is, you know, they're, they're very intelligent, right? And so you can see, I mean, I, I'd say just to, to pull a name out of the air, Macron, uh, is a classic kind of, you know, high IQ, verbally adept psychopath. Um, but there's many of them. Obama probably, um, uh, Trump all, is definitely... All like the a, hints of state come to mind when you... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All of them, all of them. So is in the, that a prerequisite to become a head of state? Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, this is... Yeah, I mean, no, nobody who actually has a kind of a normal, healthy brain you know, wherein you're, you're, you're sort of able to care about others is going to make it to any level of power in, in, this, in, in, this, in the establishment structure, right? So um, that's just what it is. It's just a symbol of that. Um, I, I, I based the hair on Dick Cheney, but I didn't really think about it much. I had yeah. not noticed that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, because he's got the Republican and Democrats, you know, on each side. So very... I mean, is there really a difference at this point? I mean... Of course, there is, there's window dressing type differences, but at, at the base, there's, there's no difference between Exactly, them. exactly. Um, yeah, and I, you know, I just, I mean, we could spend 10 hours interpreting this. I just, <laughs> um, skip into, um, this is interesting. This is not necessarily a question, but I, you know, your, um, the low rider scene where he's in the city and there's a, there's a sign here that says Maggie Sanger's planned parenthood weeding out the weeds. Mm. I've got the original quote here and yeah, it, that's where it comes from. Um, this was from April 8th, 1923, the New York times. She was talking about birth control and she said, quote, it means the release and cultivation of the better racial elements in our society and the gradual suppression elimination and even um and even extir- extirpation of defective stocks those human weeds which threaten the blooming of the finest flowers of american civilization you know i mean there it is as far as i know that that was i mean that quote is probably from a speech that she was going around america doing um to various kind of um uh, groups like yeah. kkk type groups and stuff like that but I mean, at that time, everybody was in the KKK, right? I think Woodrow Wilson was in the KKK. Yeah, I'm not sure. True. I don't know what I mean. But I mean, a lot of them were. Um, maybe she... from the New York Times, 1923. So yeah, yeah, she yep. was. Um, yeah, she was a eugenicist all around. But you know, I yeah, I like that. There's that reference. That reference, if you're not familiar with that story, would go over the heads of a lot of people. I mean, this is an example of how you keep going through the book again and again. You just always noticing things that you mm. did not. Um, here's a question for you. And the next one, you've got the misogynistic alpha male type in the, the truck driver in the form of the bear. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, I guess he is. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought I didn't mean to be misogynistic. I meant him to be just hypocritical. You know, you always get these kind of fat guys who are like, um, oh, no fat, <laughs> no fat bitches, kind of stuff, right? And it's just like. <laughs> That was my uh, interpretation. Have you looked at myself <laughs> recently? But yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I'm going to, yeah, hypocritical. I, I love this, Simon. This is great. But my question is, on the water tower, you've got um, the chemical, the chemistry written out. And I had to look it up. Um, hexafluorosilic acid. Uh, well, thank you for your conscientiousness that you did. <laughs> Obviously, a very conscientious guy who looked it up. But yeah, yeah. Hexafluorosilic acid, I think. 60% or over 60% of America's water supply is um, uh, what they call fluoridated, but actually is not, it's not medical grade fluoride. It's this, um, well, it's a waste product from the fertilizer industry, hexafluorosic acid. And so, yeah, that's what that is. Yeah. Excellent. So and this, uh, when, this is one of these things, which is just really clown world insane that they're, they're putting this stuff in the water supply. And I mean, even according to the official science, it's only going to have an impact on your teeth as it goes past your teeth when you drink it. I mean, once it goes into you, it's just like one second as it touches your teeth and then it's in your body. And after it's gone into your stomach, it's not going to have any effect on you. It's just um, madness. It's madness. I mean, it's, yeah, but I, I think this, this is one of these things, you know, are you familiar with, um, uh, the, the lobotomist, just as an example, the lobotomist, um, this guy, I forget his name, but he drove around the United States in the 1960s. And s do you know who I'm talking about? He had a lobotomy had truck me before two weeks ago. I would not know, but I know exactly. Who, I don't remember his name, but I, I saw a little mini documentary about him. Yeah. yeah. And he, he was the one to discover how to do it through the eye. Yeah. yeah with an ice pick. So yeah. I mean, he, he did over 3000 lobotomies on you know, people who are in mental institutions, just driving around in a, in, a, in, a, in a van. And we look back on this with just absolute horror now, right? I think it's the same sort of thing. We're going to look back in the future and, and sort of look at the present time and, and think like, what, you, you're giving like hormones to, to kids, making them transgender at four years old and putting this, you know, uh, what, what is just poison in the water poison. supply? What the yeah. fuck? Like, can I swear? What were people doing? You know, like it's just yeah, insane. But um, the swearing is allowed, Simon. No problem. <laughs> okay, good. Fuck, 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 fuck. Good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's that's the only way to describe it. Um, it's just disgusting. You'll be pleased to know that I was aware of the floor water fluoridation problem long before we moved back to the USA. So yeah, we get our water from a natural spring. And yeah. oh, okay, good. You, you, you're okay. Is Texas fluoridated? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right, uh, right, right. Yeah, I I don't even use the water here to cook. Yeah, I'll use it to wash, yeah, and shower, but right. but uh, yeah, it's disgusting. Um, I have some activist friends in this area who have gone to the city council several times, and the group that was in charge of making the decision, they presented the evidence and they said, "Look, you're right," but you know, the FDA or whoever, if they say it's safe, you know, they did not want to risk their own necks. Yeah. You know what I mean, and That's it's a whole serious, very guest situation. Yeah. I mean, so it's, that's how the whole thing works. I mean, it's not, it's not one huge conspiracy where everybody's in the know. It just, it's all about uh, who's above me and am I going to get in trouble or am I going to get trouble? Uh, am I going to get grief for um, kicking up a dust about something? And um, yeah, just, um, well, what can you say? It's just madness, right? Don't drink the water. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, I mean, I, I studied it back in the past, and I mean, one of the most uh, egregious things that it does is, is cause calcification of the pineal gland. Yeah. The pineal gland is responsible for regulating so many aspects of our hormonal balance. And so, um, yeah. And if people want a good example, I mean, in Japan, uh, after the U.S. occupation, I think uh, during the occupation period from 1951 or 1952, they they got the Japanese to fluoridate the water, and then the Japanese t uh, took it out in 1963. It was in the water supply for about 11 years, and then the Japanese got worried about it, 
and um, of course, right? And they took it out. So I mean, huh. yeah. I didn't know that. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, good on the Japanese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For yeah, and of course there are plenty of references in the book to GMOs, which you know, it's disgusting as, a, you know, another, the same crime against humanity as the water fluoridation are GMOs. Um, what's the situation with GMOs in Japan? Um, well, is it allowed? And, and I suppose if it is allowed, they would have to label it, yeah? It, it's not allowed. Um, it, but I mean, of course, there's import food shops where, you know, it's unregulated with the import foods. Um, my issue with the GMOs, I, I don't know enough about the science to, to really know whether you know what the actual impacts are my issue is the fact that people are not given a choice and the, the lack of labeling and everything like that you know just kind of pushing these and it, it's if you look at human history there's just so many examples of humans discovering some new technology and then uh you know without really testing it just releasing it into into the environment or releasing it into the the society and then just having massive uh blowback from it you know yeah. years later and uh that's the issue i have you know with the gmo stuff so um and as far as i know the usa is is it the only country that doesn't label still I, i'm not sure are there any other countries that don't that don't have to label it i, I don't know offhand yeah i don't know um, um i i, but, I Obviously, I mean, you got uh, the what? Um, what's the company? Uh, Monsanto and uh, Bayer Monsanto now. Yeah, yeah, Bayer Monsanto and the other one that I can't. Syngenta know. is the other one. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, these guys just I mean have so much influence over the U.S. Uh, political system that um, I, yeah, I, I would guess it's going to be very difficult to get labeling pushed through. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah, it's a never-ending revolving door yeah, full yeah, of scumbags. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, when we go shopping here, um, you know, living in, it was easy to avoid living in Spain because they did have it in Spain, but it was clearly labeled. Okay, you can't argue with that. But um, in the USA, you know, unless the ingredients are absolute non-GMO certified, you can't trust it. And even then, it wouldn't surprise me if there's some kind of loophole there where they're able to get it to us. But it's it's kind of crap because you if the you know when you do go out to a restaurant, which we do every once in a while, you just know that you're getting a mouthful of GMOs. Um, you just know it. Um, yeah. There's a chain here called Chipotle, which they claim all their ingredients are non-GMO, um, and I think that's good. But I mean, maybe you know, as people become more aware of this issue, there'll be more business opportunities for restaurants like that. But yeah. <laughs> um, I'm skipping forward here. Um, here's a reference to the MK Ultra Monarch Mind Control. Uh, <laughs> you got it. Oh, well done. Really? Yeah. You're talking about the Las Vegas one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Monarch programmed kitty. I mean, we see that. <laughs> I mean, tell you know, you, I don't, I can't prove it, but you know that stuff's still going on. <laughs> uh, I, I would say that it's it's. Um, I would say that it's gone, it's, it's left the testing lab and it's now out in the society now. I mean, yeah, it, yeah. you just look it's at the- on TV. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, you don't have to like tie a kid up and rape them in a, in a dark room somewhere. I mean, you can just have this kind of extremely sexualized, um, uh, like I, I have a young daughter, like she's five. And I mean, I'm very, very careful about policing um, what they watch because I, I canceled the Netflix account because I just, you know, they were watching something one time I, I, I was cooking and then I came in and I watched it. I was like, what is this? <laughs> it's just like, Oh my God. It's like got, got a lot of, um, kind of, um, uh, hidden sexualization, you know, just princesses who it, I'm not going to go into it and I'm not going to sound like a prude. I'm not a prude, but like, um, yeah, I'd say that that kind of sexualization of children is, is obviously uh, left the testing lab and is out now rife in this society, right? I mean, it's just everywhere. So um, it's, it's not good for kids at all. And, and um, you've got YouTube. Um, you know, YouTube is banning 
anyone who speaks the truth now, um, and maybe even some people who don't speak the truth, but either way, yet they're allowing things like Elsa Gate. Do you remember Elsa Gate? It rings a bell, but I don't know. What, what is that? Again, it was just all these innocent, seemingly uh, people dressed up as Disney fictional characters, like in their own house. But yeah, they were starting, it was just, um, they were doing scandalous things, you know, um, getting on the toilet and having a baby, a little Spider-Man baby. I don't know. It was just sick, twisted stuff. And some parents caught on about that and it created, created quite a ruckus. Uh, uh, okay. I think I know what you mean. It's a, you, this is the thing that happened last year with all the um, kind of sexualized videos for kids on YouTube, which were sort of just... Yeah, yeah they're yeah. still out there. Um, but yeah, I mean, Netflix, but yeah, keep your kid, don't your, don't let your kids go loose with YouTube either. Because I think it's honestly, my kids, I have let them loose on YouTube before keeping an eye on. And I swear it's just designed to inevitably draw them into these really dodgy uh, channels that you know, you're just like, no, no, don't trust it, you know? Uh, yeah, I don't know if I'd say it was... My interpretation is it's not so much a design. It's just, I mean, when when a society uh, is is kind of turning and and uh, well in decline, these are inevitably symptoms which are going to come out of of a decline phase, right? So, mm, yeah. Anyway. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. There is yeah. Some stuff I want to talk. Uh, like maybe we can talk about it later about uh, like regarding more generally autonomy and um, uh, self-governance and pornography and these kinds of things. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, maybe I can, yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll just mention it now if I can. Um, I, I've come to sort of think recently, I mean, that pornography is one of the most destructive things, you know, uh, <laughs> that has actually happened in our culture. It's, it's you know, um, the, the, the sexual urge, especially in men, is inherently linked to the drive to achieve, you know, and to our life drive, right? And so uh, every year the Alexa, you know, survey comes out and porn sites dominate, you know, and it's causing a huge amount of young men to, well, just basically underachieve and not do anything with their lives because they're just masturbating over, you know, images of, of women. Yeah. And it's incredibly destructive. So, and I wanted to say that we're obviously talking to a small audience of people who want to better themselves. If you are jacking off to porn, you really got to stop like, uh, or, or at least control yourself, do something, um, you know, masturbate over still images rather than video images to start with and then start using your imagination thereafter. And it will, you know, there's, there's a bunch of websites which are trying to help people with porn addiction. But I sort of think that it's one of the, the main issues, even though it so sounds kind of ridiculous and, and small, it's actually a really big problem. Um, yeah. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, I, I tend to agree. Um, I've heard, I mean, you, if you think about it, boys will not know, they won't even know how to talk to women. Do you know what I mean? Um, their social skills will go down the hill if they're spending all their time in, you know what I mean? Um, for one thing, getting out there and actually interacting with people in real life, um, that is becoming a lost art, especially for young people, where this is the negative side of technology. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Good point, Simon. Very good. Um, what that comes to mind, do you remember the film Something About Mary, where Ben Stiller he was wanking to, um, it was a lingerie ad from Sears or something in the women. Uh, room. Yeah. <laughs> I do remember he gets some, he gets semen on his ear or something and yeah. she puts it in her hair, right? Yeah. 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 Just, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, maybe, uh, that maybe from that point on, it all goes downhill. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, I just wanted to, um, yeah, point out, um, yeah, at the final, at the end of it, you've got quite a few military vehicles with uh, RSHA um, on them. What, what, what does that stand for? Oh, God, um, that's German. It's, it's uh, I, I can't think of the German. It's basically the German for Homeland Security, which um, um, 
Okay. It's the name of the homeland, the version of Homeland Security underneath the Third Reich. Okay. 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 Yeah. I would not. I would not have known that. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Right. Yeah, because it's quite. Yeah, you, know, you see it on all the vehicles and so, I believe some of the planes. And I like how you have the blimp here, which says Panopticon, which mm. is arguably what we're living in now with you know, with the rise of technocracy and AI, we are living in a panopticon. That is exactly what we are in. So yep. <laughs> if you, I mean, they can access, I, mean, I forget that. I'm, I'm not a big tech guy, but I, I know that um, basically, you know, nothing is secure, right? Your emails are not secure. Your, um, uh, so many aspects of tech are, are not secure, right? So, you know, if, if people want access to your stuff, they can get it. Um, yeah, so. Exactly. Um, and this was proven by an NSA whistleblower. He was interviewed, I believe, in the Peace Revolution podcast, episode 85, I believe. You took that Vinny? Maybe. I can't remember his name. But he was okay. saying, yeah, once if you're targeted, if, if they target you, that's it. They can find, they'll know more about you than you will know about yourself. Everything you've ever done, mm -hmm. everywhere you go, er, anything, um, credit card, every monetary exchange you've made. And yeah, you're talking about Edward Binney, I think his name's Edward. Um, he was kind of the, the, you know, Snowden was the guy who was marketed as the, um, and I'm still, I, I'm kind of suspicious of Snowden. I mean, nobody gets a Hollywood film made about them without being a bit of a limited hangout or something. I know exactly what you mean, yeah. Yeah, um, I think his name was Binny. Uh, well, his name is Binny, but I forget his first name. Okay. But he was the original kind of Snowden who was actually the real deal. Um, yeah, I would say it was probably him. The airplanes in the, the Panopticon um, scenery that you painted, very similar to those in Pink Floyd's The Wall. Was that influence there? Um, no, I mean, so the original is just up there, actually. You can sort of okay. see. Okay. I can kind of see the, yeah. <laughs> I can wonder. Uh, no, they're just, they're drones. They're, they're, they're the, uh, okay. they're, they're based on the, um, uh, I forget the name of the drone. I the drone know. that hit the Pentagon? <laughs> <laughs> actually, Which Ryan, I Ryan Dawson convinced me that that was actually a plane. So I'm not sure. I, I don't know about the Pentagon stuff. Uh, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Ryan Dawson's work, but I mean, he. No, I'm not, no. Okay, so he, he, he uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't really care, actually, about whether a plane hit the Pentagon or not. It's, it's sort of gone past the point of, of whether that matters. But um, I don't know. He, he had stuff on his website, which he showed me, which was, um, I mean, he lives in Japan, too. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know. It, uh, and that leads to my last reference there, actually. Um, I noticed, um, or oh, my second to last reference, the, the airplane, American Airlines, N644AA. And I looked mm. at that up, and that is the plane that supposedly hit the Pentagon. <laughs> good, good, good. Yeah. Oh, you're very, you're very conscientious. That's good. That's, you're the type of person that I wrote this book for. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, because you just know all the smallest minute details are likely to have some kind of you know, reference. And yeah. finally, Humphreys made it to the beach. He's met, I, said, I see he's made a little girlfriend here. Um, I'm happy for them. And I see there are, I counted 11 voluntarious flags. <laughs> yeah. Would you consider yourself a voluntarist these days? Not anymore. I mean, uh, yeah, yes, yes, but it's an ideal which will, I, I understand will not be achieved. Um, and I, this is something I wanted to say actually is um, one of, one of the big changes that I have, in my own politics since I published that book is an understanding that uh, right-wing libertarianism will be absolutely crushed in the face of left-wing authoritarianism. And we have obviously a, a, a <laughs> the, the society is trending towards authoritarianism uh, yeah. regardless, uh, just because of technology, because of many aspects um, and yeah, libertarian, I mean, right-wing libertarianism is what I wish for. It's yeah. what I want. 
but yeah. it's not necessarily something that can actually be, um, you know, um, carried uh, out. Well, I, I just doubt it will be achieved, you know. And so, um, yeah, that, that, that's we, we're going towards an authoritarian system. I, I prefer that it was um, not going in that direction, but um, yeah, I don't see any other. I don't see it realistically um, trending any other way. So um, you should come mm -hmm. hang out with us in Autonomy One. Uh, it might boost your optimism a little bit. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah. No. It's, yeah. I mean, if it's you're able to get a sort of, you know, a, a geographical region where you're able to sort of defend that region and and then have that type of state within it. I mean, I, I do think that America is heading towards balkanization at some point. Yeah. Uh, and I, I guess that it's probably going to come sooner than people realize. I would say probably, you know, within the next 20 years, the, the okay. United States is going to start splitting up uh, into, into separate regions. Um, in, in many ways, it already is, although, you know, that's just, um, it's not officially so. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, I would still say, uh, you know, in a utopian world, it's what I wish for, but in reality, it's not going to be achievable. Very good, Simon. Um, so you're uh, just a bit of a plug in here. So your book is at Simon Crims, no, is it? No, it's crims.com. Is that right? That's correct. Yep. Yeah. And it, people can, I mean, I don't care about money so much. Um, you know, so people can download it for free and um, the, the, the PDF is free. There's also a video version I did on YouTube. Um, so yeah, but, um, I, you know, my yeah, ultimate properly goal. digest the book. I think you need it in hand, you know? Well, if, you, if you're going to read it to kids, yeah. And I mean, the, the reason I created it was for, well, for people like you who are conscientious enough to go through and, and work out the details inside of there. That's the adult side. And then you've got your kids and hopefully they are going to, um, you know, ask you questions and you can start a conversation based on their questions. And, and you know, it, it, that, that's what the intention was. Any future projects going on with you? Yeah, I'm, I'm working on my next book. It's a, it's a much bigger project. Um, it's going to take uh, quite a few years. It's a coloring book. Um, and um, yeah, that, that, that's, then I've got other stuff going on as well, but um, that, that's the main thing that I'm working on artistically. Yeah, that's great. Um, uh, so uh, it's a coloring book, you say? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, cool. I look so forward to it. You have to keep us posted. And then people can color it themselves. So it's, it's a kind of similar thing to Roller Dog, except uh, much. I mean, this one is 7,000 words. So it's going to end up being a few hundred pages with illustrations. And then people can color it themselves if they wish. That, you know. Yeah. Cool. Uh, well, Simon, any final thoughts before we wrap up? Regarding autonomy. Um, We, I, I, one of the big changes in my um, understanding of the world since I published Roller Dog is that uh, kind of rabid individualism is actually quite a negative thing if you are going up against groups which have a more uh, collectivist kind of sense of themselves. Yeah. And that must be understood. Individualism is great. It, it, and, and it's given uh, Europe and the West enormous power, but it will fail spectacularly if you are competing with groups which have a collectivist sense of themselves. And so we want to retain that individualism, but also have a collective sense about it, if that makes sense. To yeah, but yeah, very good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know what to say to that. I, I you know, individuals, but in a voluntary society could create and gain momentum as power, you know, as a unit of power. But like you said, to face the authoritarian left is going to take some serious, uh, yeah, um, exponential steps to be able to confront this machine that this technocratic machine, technocratic nightmare that we are currently living in. 
and that most people have no idea about. You know, everything's hunky dory and everything they see on the news is true. It's frustrating. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it's been a long time since I was in the States, so I'd have to, um, you know, um, I, I, I don't know. I, I guess you're correct that most people are kind of in that in that mindset. Um, I would say that uh, in just in response to that, I think that the, the point of no return has been passed and that people who are, well, in our frame of mind or with our understanding should be looking to <laughs> abandon the ramparts and look after themselves and their family. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're in a major city and you have, you know, uh, young kids or you're looking to have children in the future, I would think like probably you should be looking to move to a more country area um, and start trying to become more self-sustainable because I, I don't see that um, the, the current um, system is going to be sustainable. I think things are heading towards balkanization and collapse in certain areas. And um, I, I can confirm that that is a hot topic right now for those who know what's going on. I've never met someone who has taken the metaphorical red pill and has high ambitions to move into the city from the country. <laughs> yeah, everyone is looking to get out. Um, have you heard of a, a podcast you might like? He's based in Texas. It's called um, The Survival Podcast. His name's Jack Spierko. Um, he's, uh, I've, I've heard the name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he, um, a lot of, you know, he, he's, he's not so philosophical, even though he is um, very much in the mindset of what we're talking about, what Roller Dog is about, but he gets down to the, where the rubber meets the road, he'll, you know, he gets down to detail specific things you can do for whatever project you've got going on. And um, yeah, I recommend it if you, uh, you know, if you're in, ever interested in getting, getting in any of these projects done for anybody. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the most you can minimize your dependence on the state and on, on the kind of the system, uh, I mean, the economic system and everything, you know, our, our um, the, con the, the, the very convenient life that uh, the, the modern state has created for everybody. Um, I mean, if you think that's going to be sustainable, going forward into the future, then, um, well, disregard everything I say, but I don't think, um, I don't think there's a lot of hope that, you know, things can continue as they are forever. And so I, I if I was living in the United States, I would be kind of looking to, um, well, simplify and countrify my life. Yeah. Sort of, right. Are you familiar with Owen Benjamin? No, I'm not. Who is he? Uh, he's a comedian who he was used to be quite a famous or well, he is still quite famous but I mean he used to be a mainstream comedian who was on um uh you know comedy central and all these other things and then uh, you know a few years ago he moved out to i think washington state and started at a farm started a family huh. um so and he's he's actually quite you know um he's a very very intelligent guy and I, I would recommend that people, you know, he's very funny as well. So people should go and watch him and he, he's got a, lots of goats and chickens and he's got kids and dogs and everything. And um, yeah, I think that's a great example of the type of thing that people should be looking to do. Um, I'm definitely going to check him out. Yeah. Owen Benjamin. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we know some people up there in Washington state. So. Mm. Yep. 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 Simon, um, mm. I appreciate your time today. Thanks a lot, man. No, thank you. It's been good fun. Thank you. Cool.